Welcome to the 2018 Spring Convocation. Thank you for joining us to hear about the state of our university. I'm Lisa Carlin, the Director of University Relations and Marketing, and I have the privilege of introducing today's speakers to you. First, I want to express appreciation to all of you for sharing your talent, for your hard work, and for your commitment to the success of our students. You are the reason Fort Hayes State University continues to thrive. There are a few other things I want to mention before we begin our presentations. For those who can't be with us in person today, the convocation is being live streamed. Sometime after the event, a link to the recording will be available on YouTube, and also the PowerPoint presentation will be available on the website. And we will notify faculty and staff by email when these links have been posted. After the convocation, you're invited to gather in the lobby for light refreshments and to visit with your colleagues. And now let's begin our program. Our first presenter is Ms. Denise Orth, Faculty Senate President and Associate Professor in the Department of Allied Health. Denise will share a report from the Faculty Senate. Good afternoon. Wow, I should have worn my hat with a bill. It's very bright up here. <laughs> um, well, welcome everyone to our spring convocation. Um, each year during this convocation, the faculty senate president is required to provide an annual report um, per our bylaws. And so that's why you are graciously sitting here listening for me this afternoon, at least for a little while. Um, I hope that, you know, as I'm reading off my report, you find it enlightening and encouraging for the future of the Faculty Senate. Uh, this year has been a very active year. The Faculty Senate has worked diligently on behalf of the faculty at Fort Hayes State University. We started the year with a charge for each committee. The committees have been mindful of these charges and other topics that have surfaced throughout the year. And we frequently do have topics forwarded to us from faculty, so it's nice when we hear those. So I would encourage everyone to, to do that as well this next coming year. Uh, the charges for our different committees included um, updates from the General Education Committee, research the University 101 retention and persistent rates, uh, review courses and programs to bring before Faculty Senate for approval, review the bylaws and standing rules, develop the faculty morale survey, establish contact with SGA and the Division of Student Affairs, continue contact with CIOS and SNU campus liaison to provide a channel of communication between their campuses and the Faculty Senate, provide input on computing needs for on-campus and faculty teaching internationally. I am excited to report that many of these charges have been completed while others will continue to be discussed next year. We are still in the phase of gathering information, especially with the faculty morale survey, and that will be continued on um, in the fall semester. There is opportunity for further discussion with department faculty regarding the um, survey results, as well as our bylaws and standing rules, which should be reviewed and um, updated next year. A few years ago, um, it became evident that faculty who were living in China needed support from Faculty Senate to advocate on their behalf, and we have been very happy to do so and to bring their concerns forward to administration. One basic need that was identified early on um, were air purifiers for their apartments because the air quality is so poor. And through working with the administration who listened to our concerns, um, air purifiers were made available to the faculty and they um, happily reported that it has made a huge difference in their quality of life in China. So that is just one example of what we are, um, why Senate is here is to help our faculty um, wherever you are, on campus, adjunct, or out in our international partners. The, um, you know, the Faculty Senate works with the administration on all of these crucial types of topics so that we can advance all of our faculty initiatives. Um, 
Dr. Mason has been a very strong advocate for shared governance this year. Um, she has established regular meetings with the presidents of university support staff um, slash university professional staff, the SGA as well as faculty senate. These meetings have given each group direct access to voice our concerns, to ask for clarifications, and to provide in input on a whole host of topics. Um, it has been a pleasure for me to, to sit on this committee with those other ladies and with Dr. Mason as our leader to have a, a very conversational committee where we can discuss topics with one another and, and it's really been great to work with her this year. So I would, would like to extend a, a very warm thank you for including Faculty Senate on that committee. Um, in this past year, uh, Faculty Senate also held a special meeting to discuss the virtual college funding which is paid to the departments, the deans, and the library. Mike Barnett provided a historical perspective of this practice and he also answered questions from the audience. It was a very enlightening meeting and I would like to publicly thank Mike for answering all of our questions and taking the time um, in private meetings with myself to help me grasp the virtual college funding in a better, um, better understanding. During the spring semester, it has become apparent that faculty need to formulate a list of our priorities for moving Forte State University forward. Forte, our Faculty Senate has started compiling priorities and I anticipate the discussion to continue into the next, next academic year. It is important and necessary for faculty to advocate for the human capital on campus in regard to our vision for student and faculty success. It is wonderful to have state-of-the-art buildings and classrooms in which to teach, but as we all know, the physical capital is only the exterior. It is the interior or human capital which makes our students successful. In this academic year, the Faculty Senate has worked on resolutions and passed some for recommendations for discontinuing the syllabus server and to collaborate with USD 49 to determine a status of university operations during severe weather. A process was developed to send resolutions to the president and provost for their consideration. This process has provided Faculty Senate with an avenue for sending our recommendations forward for consideration and to receive a final decision from the president and provost. In conclusion, I would like to thank the Faculty Senate representatives for all of their hard work on behalf of the faculty of this great university. I would also like to thank Dr. Mason and Dr. Briggs for their commitment to shared governance. I truly do have great hopes for the future of this institution and I have learned a lot in this year as the Faculty Senate President and hope that I have served you all well. Thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you, Denise, for sharing the activities of Faculty Senate in the past year. We will now hear from Dr. Jennifer bonds Rackey, Dean of the Graduate School, who will present a report on graduate studies. Give me just one second to enter the password and we'll get started. Try it one more time. Okay, I still didn't get it yet.
commit it to memory, and we all get raises. <laughs> <clears throat> thank you, Lisa, and thank you, Dr. Mason. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm excited to be here today to share with you an update on the activities of our graduate faculty and students. As you can see from this outline, I will provide a brief year in review, discuss the activities of the curriculum subcommittee, announce award winners, and conclude with the accomplishments from OSSP. Let's begin with the year in review. Graduate faculty and students continue to amaze me with their pursuit of excellence and dedication to higher education. Work of the graduate school community can be represented in the following categories. Structure. Two structural changes occurred at the beginning of the year. The Office of Scholarship and Sponsored Projects was returned to the graduate school, and the MLS degree was moved to the College of Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences. Operations. Members of the Graduate Council updated operating papers, the grade appeal policy, university catalog content, and English proficiency requirements for non-native speaking GTAs. These updated documents, as well as our monthly meeting minutes, are available on the grad school website for the campus community to review. Graduate faculty status. Graduate faculty requirements were revised to allow qualifications for graduate faculty status to be determined at the department level per HLC requirements. Additionally, the contributions of our professional advisors are recognized in the updates. Innovations. Graduate faculty continue to be innovative in attracting quality students. For example, Accelerated master's programs were introduced for the MPSs in leadership studies, human resource management, criminal justice, as well as the master's in school psychology. These programs will allow high caliber students to get a jump start on their graduate degrees. Additionally, in early spring 2018, KSDE approved a pilot apprenticeship licensure pathway for school districts to identify persons of great potential to become fully licensed special educators. AEP and the College of Education was the first KBOR institution to develop a pathway program to meet this need. Credit for prior learning. Thanks to Tim Crowley's leadership, credit for prior learning was approved by the Graduate Council and we are leading our peers in these efforts. Opportunities. Our community continues to develop opportunities for our students. For example, the Graduate School and the Forsyth Library relaunched the Academic Leadership Journal in student research. The mission of the journal is to provide a forum for exceptional student research and to promote collaboration between students and faculty. In addition, the Graduate Council provided professional development trainings for GTAs, and these trainings were available in person and online. Recognition. We have enjoyed state and national recognition for our efforts. Our students were recognized for their outstanding research at the Capital Graduate Research Summit in Topeka. And I'm also pleased to announce that at the national level, our quality graduate programs were recognized by Abound. At this time, I would like to invite Dr. Paul Faber, member of the Curriculum Subcommittee, to come forward and provide an update. Thank you, and thank you, Jen. I, Dr. Brooke Moore is really the chair of this committee and uh, she did a very able and very congenial job of it, but she's unable to be here today. So that's why I'm taking a minute to say a bit about what we did. The, uh, the curriculum committee or subcommittee gave quite a bit of time to consideration of new and revised proposals in, uh, for courses and for concentrations. And, most of those, at least, eventually were approved. Some are still in consideration and will be carried over to next year. 
but we did approve 12 new courses and 10 fairly significant course changes this year. There are new concentrations in the specialist in education degree, two new concentrations there. There were revisions or a significant revision to the structure of the MLS degree, the Master of Liberal Studies degree, a new concentration in the MBA program, a new concentration in the MLS program, and a chemistry concentration, a new concentration in the Masters of Science in Education program. So it was a pretty productive year. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Faber, and thank you to all the members of the Curriculum Subcommittee for their hard work this year. These many achievements would not be possible without the dedication of our faculty and staff. At this time, I would like to recognize the 2017-18 Graduate School Faculty Award winners. Thanks to everyone who nominated their peers for these awards. Please hold your applause until all names have been called, and award winners, if you are in attendance, please stand when your name is called. Outstanding research mentors were Dr. Grady Dixon and Dr. Nicholas Caparuso, and Rachel Dolacek received the Outstanding Advising Award. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> and finally, many graduate students listed on the screen deserve to be recognized for their research, scholarly projects, and outstanding service in the GTA roles. These students have been notified of their awards and received an official FHSU certificate. Before I turn things over to Leslie Page to conclude the Graduate School Annual Report, I would like to personally thank Linda Gardner, Christy Mergen, Caitlin Polly, and Joanne Crispin. These individuals are the heart of the Graduate School and I would be lost without them. Thank you. Happy Friday, everybody. I'll be talking about some of the highlights of the Office of Scholarship and Sponsor projects for this year. New to our office is Misty Kuntz. She joined us in October, and she is off to a great start. As a matter of fact, one of the grants that she helped with was recently funded, and we are very, very glad to have her on our team. These figures reflect what we know as of May 1st, and they are incorrect. We just received notice of some more grants that are being awarded. This is a good kind of not being correct. <laughs> we have submitted um, about 40 proposals to date, requesting $9.5 million in funding so far this year, and we've received $4.5 million in awards and we're waiting to hear about another $2 million in, in funding. We'll be submitting more grants over the next two months, so this is just a snapshot of where we are right now. As you can see, grant activity is increasing. We submitted 49 grants totaling $6.5 million last year, and with two more months left this year, we have already submitted 40 proposals requesting $9.5 million. We've already received more grant funds to date this year than we did in fiscal year 17. Additionally, we know we are receiving more awards, we just haven't gotten the official notification yet. These increases are due to the efforts of faculty and staff who are writing grants. I would like to thank you for your time and for your effort because it is helping to move Fort Hayes State forward. Another area that the Office of Scholarship and Sponsored Projects has oversight is in research compliance. And CITI, or city training as we commonly call it, is available for faculty, staff, and students. 
This training is required for research applications as well as for many federal grant programs such as those that are sponsored by the National Science Foundation or by the National Institutes of Health. Also, a lot of our faculty assign the training to supplement their research courses. As you can see, we have almost 2,600 Fort Hayes students and faculty as well as employees who have registered with this service and we have had almost 1,200 courses completed since last July. This is another slide that's not accurate because the Institutional Review Board, the IRB, is meeting next week and we are still receiving applications to conduct research. The IRB meets monthly. We have 10 members and nine secondary reviewers who represent all colleges as well as the community. As a matter of fact, one of our community members, Errol Wirtz, has been an active member of our IRB for eight years and sadly he just informed us he will be re, uh, retiring from our board. So if any of you know Errol or happen to bump into him in the community, please be sure to thank him for his service to Fort Hayes State University. I'd also like to thank Whitney Jeter, who has been of tremendous help with the workload with uh, the IRB. As you can see, we've had 133 new submissions and counting so far this year. This committee provides oversight for animal use and care, and we meet about four to six times a year. Uh, this past year, we processed 20 animal use protocols and also inspected the facilities at Sternberg and at the Wetland Center. The undergraduate research uh, experience includes research, scholarly, and creative activities and includes all disciplines. The URE initiative continues to grow at Fort Hayes thanks to the faculty who are invested in this high impact strategy to engage students in learning. Just a few of the highlights from the undergraduate research experience steering group. Uh, it kind of gives you an example, some examples of a lot of the activities that we do to enhance undergraduate research, scholarship, and creative activities. These are just a few of the activities that we sponsor. I do want to point out that, of course, Dr. Hendrada Ali was our outstanding undergraduate research mentor this year. The 2018 award will be announced at our summer convocation. Um, also, Ashley Lockwood, Russell Krug, and Rachel Anlicker were recognized during under National Undergraduate Research Week as outstanding undergraduate scholars. Uh, a new activity we tried this year was the Ice Cream Social, and, um, and that was hosted with uh, Forsyth Library, and Deb Ludwig had to go out and get more ice cream because we had so many people come to that. The Undergraduate Research Experience Steering Group is planning some new activities for next year, so stay tuned. The URE grant program remains very popular. Uh, we received 16 applications last fall and we were able to fund 14. We'll be releasing the request for proposals for the next year very soon, and applications for next year will be due September 5th. A group of really amazing undergraduate students represented Fort Hayes State University at the Capitol in February. We had five outstanding posters and their presenters in the rotunda in the state capitol talking to the state legislators about our, uh, their work. A new initiative this year is the Graduate Scholarly Experience Grants. It's, um, we've had about three semesters worth of this program. It provides uh, funding for grad students to travel or for research supplies. So this past year, we received 35 applications requesting of about $20,000. We were able to fund 23 of them with the, our available funds. And this report would not be complete without mentioning the 13th Annual Scholarly and Creative Activities Day. Um, it was, by all accounts, a major success. We had 132 posters this year that were reviewed by 48 judges. We had 147 creative works. 
They were judged by community art artists. And thanks, of course, go to Linda Ganstrom for her help with the creative exhibit. We had 90 people from campus and from the community um, attend the 15 different oral presentations. And thank you to everybody who participated, whether it was to help your students in preparing their posters, their presentations, or their creative works, or presenting your own work, or volunteering to help with the event. We aren't exactly sure how many people came, uh, but we think it was somewhere in the 600 to 700 range. So thank you all for your efforts to make this campus-wide event so successful. Even if it isn't a Mac, I can do a little magic. Anyway, thank you all. Misty and I will be here all summer. We definitely welcome any opportunities to talk to you about grants or about research. Have a great summer, and thank you very much for your support. Thank you, Jen, Paul, and Leslie for your reports. And now our final presenter is Dr. Tisa Mason, our 10th president of Fort Hayes State University, who will share information about the state of the university and recognize the spring faculty award recipients. Thank you everyone for the warm welcome and especially for your hard work. We have so much for which to be proud. So you may be wondering, what have I learned this semester and how will what I learn inform my next steps? So I built the agenda to begin to share with you my focus areas from this past semester, and then to talk about my next steps, I'd like to provide some updates, both legislative and financial, and then talk a little bit about summer construction so you'll know how to traverse the campus. I'm very excited to share a sampling of our semester successes, and then my favorite part, recognitions and awards. My first focus area this semester has been building authentic relationships. This semester has involved a variety of activities such as meet and greets, attending events and meetings, welcoming people to our campus, offering remarks at a variety of events, writing columns every other week, and it's been really fun to see how newspapers across the state of Kansas have picked up those columns. The last one made the Topeka Journal. Speaking with media, I do a spot every month, and of course, interacting with social media. The focus of all of these activities have been to establish authentic relationships while sharing the remarkable Fort Hayes State University story to talk about your hard work and outstanding results. My second focus area was accelerating the learning curve. And in general, I'd like to thank everyone for your thoughts and your advice and your welcome. But I do have a few specific mentions I'd like to offer. First, I'd like to thank the faculty for their time in organizing and hosting me at departmental meetings. I have found these meetings to be incredibly helpful, not only to learn the lay of the land, but especially inspirational in listening to your impact stories and the forward momentum of how our departments are shaping student and ultimately alumni success. I also want to thank AAUP leadership for helping me understand more clearly the role of AAUP, current challenges, and especially for the commitment to collegiality, continuous improvement, and especially share leadership. 
I want to thank the shared governance leaders, Denise Orth, Lisa Lang, and Emily Brandt, for helping me get up to speed with current initiatives and priorities for each of your organizations, and your willingness to work across our leadership teams for the collective well-being of the university. I also want to thank Deborah Prideau for legislative introductions and background information regarding historic and current challenges and opportunities. I thank Jason Willoughby and the staff of the foundation for connecting me with donors and the foundation board to talk about successes, opportunities, and a strong commitment to firmly align donor-centered philanthropy with the strategic priorities of this university. And finally, I wish to thank the vice presidents, deans, and the president staff for getting me up to speed on both current initiatives and processes, many, many of which have changed since my departure. My third focus area was developing a culture of shared leadership. One initiative has involved moving policy decisions to the cabinet level with an expectation that cabinet members are discussing proposed policies and policy revisions with their constituents. I also meet, as Denise said, with the presidents of faculty, staff, and student senates every other week to exchange information and develop strategies to lead collectively. I firmly believe the way I structured the provost search is reflective of my commitment to shared leadership. And developing a culture of shared leadership will continue to be a focus area. My fourth focus area has been on sharing information. I'm just beginning this work and will continue to have conversations around strategies for both internal and external communication but some of the things I have done this semester internally include sharing the summary notes of cabinet meetings with the campus, attending meetings across campus to share information and to answer questions, sending campus-wide emails outlining decisions regarding the provost search, as well as budget decisions. And I will provide a State of the University address three times a year, August, January and May. And I would love to hear your thoughts and how you'd like to be kept up to date. As I plan my priorities over the summer and into the fall, I have three primary goals. My first goal is to build a strong leadership team. And of course, at the forefront of my mind is the hiring of our next provost. So at this time, I'd like to ask the search committee for the provost and vice president for academic affairs to please stand so we can thank you for the efforts that you're putting in to help us lead this campus. Members of the committee, please stand. It is our firm intent to have on-campus interviews early fall a decision by mid-fall, and a new provost on campus for January. This summer, I would be thinking about the size of the executive leadership team and the positions on that team. As we all know, effective teams are not simply a collection of people. So I will begin to build processes around vulnerability-based trust, mastering conflict, achieving commitment, embracing accountability, and focusing on results. My second goal is to move forward with strategic planning. I've been working with Tim Crowley and Deb Ludwig and the Strategic Planning Committee. At this point, I would like to ask the Strategic Planning Committee to stand so that we can thank you for the work that you've done up to this point. Members of the Strategic Planning Committee.
At the fall convocation, you will receive in your hands a high-level framework for our strategic plan. Following convocation, we will enter an open comment period. All voices are important and essential to the process. Following the open comment period, we will go into an endorsement process. At that point, I will ask the Faculty Senate, the Staff Senate, and the Student Government Association, and because we want to align Donor Center Philanthropy with our strategic plan, the Executive Committee of the Foundation Board of Directors to endorse our high-level framework. At that point, our next steps will to be build, to build one to three-year plans from the grassroots up in alignment with the endorsed framework. My third goal is to work to strengthen our commitment to data-informed governance. Here's an example of what happens when you do not have good data. The fact is, the pace of change this day, as you know, is immense and intense. We are called on to manage the present while we build the future. And to do this, I believe that we will need to get focused as a whole, enhance communication, align, coordinate, and integrate communication or information, and especially grow what works and to have the courage to change what does not. Our recent HLC report indicates that we have opportunity to enhance the integration between planning, goal setting, and implementation, as well as to strengthen our practices around utilizing results. Now, in my opinion, based on my department visits, I believe we're doing a really great job of this at the departmental level. I have been truly inspired by your vision, your planning, and your results. Now I believe that we need to achieve the same quality at the institutional level. And we'll begin this work by moving forward with the strategic planning and resource allocation process. I am going to look back at major university investments over the past three to five years, and together with team members, look at determining efficacy, and once again, grow what's working, and have the courage to change strategy and realign resources for things that are not effective. And of course, we will work on improving the processes as outlined in the Higher Learning Commission report. And now, I have some good news on the legislative front. The conference committee decision of investing in higher education by dedicating $15 million towards the restoration of base will result in Fort Hay State University receiving an additional $637,554, and I think that deserves a round of applause. I know our community would like to have more information regarding the financial status, initiatives, and plans of our university. As has been mentioned earlier during the semester, Mike shared requested financial information with both the Faculty Senate and AAUP. As we move forward, we'll continue to enhance communication strategies and processes regarding the budget and financial decisions. Today, I'd like to take just a minute to share some very, very, very basic information. Here you see our composite financial index as reported to the Kansas Board of Regents. 
Now, there's a lot of great information here, but for today's purposes, I'm only going to focus on the last column, the sum composite financial index number of 5.31. So what exactly does a 5.31 CFI rating mean? Well, according to industry standards, it means that Fort Hayes State University is healthy. We are not Pitt State University who eliminated 35 positions last year and just announced the elimination of another 19. We are not Kearney who recently cut 3.4 million and 38 positions. And we are not North Dakota who after doing a 20% budget reduction, the governor just asked the universities to do another 10% with a 3% contingency and should that go through in North Dakota, the governor will have cut that budget one third in four years. Fort Hayes State University is healthy thanks to your hard work, which has resulted in growth and creativity. At Fort Hayes State University, our mind is set on what can and should be. We take intelligent risks in our resolve to solve problems. We think differently. The task before us, as indicated in this chart, is to focus our resources to enable us to compete in the future. And that's precisely what we will do through new strategic planning and resource allocation processes, supported by shared leadership and data-informed governance. We will capitalize on resources to create what's next. This chart depicts our actual revenue resources for the last fiscal year, indicating that our largest source of revenue is from tuition and fees, followed by state appropriations. Our actual revenue to date this fiscal year is on par with the same graphic. Again, our actual expenditures for the last fiscal year indicates that 37% of our budget is dedicated to instruction, followed by 12% on academic support and 11% on auxiliary, which includes programs such as Residence Life, the Memorial Union, and athletics. Here you will note that 62% of our budget is dedicated to salaries and benefits. As indicated in my campus email, we are making roughly a $645,000 investment in one-time projects for the next fiscal year. Now, I do believe it's helpful to see how multi-year decisions are impacting our future decisions. So for example, you will notice an allocation of $25,000 for faculty professional development a decision was made in prior years to annually add an additional $25,000 to the Faculty Professional Development Fund with the end goal of creating an annual budget of $350,000. The recent $25,000 allocation grew the fund to $200,000. We do have a ways to go to reach the $350,000 goal but we are making progress. What I'm trying to demonstrate in this slide is that our budget includes additional investment of more than $768,000. This is not an inclusive list. These projects and hence their funding were not included in my budget memo regarding new funding or in the previous slides because the commitments were made in the past as multi-year investments and are still being funded. These new positions were outlined also in my campus budget email. The dollars represent salaries only. With benefit, our expenditure in new positions will slightly exceed a half a million dollars. We continue to both lead in supporting the heart of the institution through instructional support, as well as recognizing that growth also drives needs and support services such as the processing of applications and financial aid and other out-of-the-class functions from safety to counseling. 
Now, I want you to know that I do understand that our growth has placed stress on our systems. As an example, a growing department such as advanced education programs, which makes up 61% of our graduate program, needs access to resource to support both students and faculty. And there are many, many, many other comparable examples across campus. I believe we can address those tensions as we continue to move forward with a strong strategic and resource allocation plan supported by data-informed governance. But I also believe it's very important to acknowledge that Fort Hayes State University does invest in its people. For our faculty, we are leading our in-state and KBOR peers in all but one category. We are behind in Coupa for most areas. I've been asked why 90%. It is because there is a 10% reduction is a cost of living reduction. Regardless, the bottom line is that we have work to do. It is much more complex to look at staff positions because there are so many different types of staff positions it just doesn't make a really good PowerPoint slide. But I assure you, we are looking at staff salaries as well, and do know that like faculty, we have work to do to achieve our compensation goals. Soon we'll begin our work to determine merit. Additionally, we will adopt a four-year plan to get employees to 90% of market average which will cost the university approximately $2 million. Achieving 90% is a priority for me, pending no financial catastrophe, but it will remain my magnetic north. I know this is a lot of information. Again, the budget overview is intended to be quick, a quick overview in the spirit of transparency. And again, the PowerPoint slides will be made available. And I am always, always happy to have further conversation as I continue to visit with the departments, shared governance groups, or any other groups or people who would like to have conversations. So now I'd like to update you on what you can expect this summer regarding construction projects. Construction on the new art facility will be in full swing. Improvements to McMidas Hall will continue including asbestos abasement and individual room improvements. The parking lot at Victor E. Village will complete. Wooster One will see exterior deck improvements. And the final phase of the sewer system upgrade in Cunningham Gross Memorial Coliseum will begin following, following graduation. And the doors are going to be replaced and electronic access will be implemented. Stroop, Stroop Hall upgrades in support of the nursing program will begin in partnership with Hayes Med. And lightning upgrades throughout the campus will continue. And now it's my pleasure to turn our attention to our leadership. I wanna thank our shared leaders. You know, shared governance sounds really great, but it also means a lot of extra meetings and extra times to do it and to do it well. And it's been my great honor to work with Emily, Denise, and Lisa, and I would like to ask you to please come forward at this time. And at this time, I would like to ask the members of the Faculty Senate, the Staff Senate, and the Student Government Association who are here, this is always a team effort, will you please stand to be recognized for your contributions?
I also want to welcome the incoming leaders. Adam, uh, Dr. Gable, and Lisa is continuing. Will you please stand to be recognized as our new leadership for next year? I very much look forward to working with each of you and to your groups. I also want to thank the AUP leadership and ask you to please stand. I can't emphasize enough how much I appreciated the onboarding meeting, participation in cabinet, and our ongoing work. Jeanette has graciously agreed to continue as president for another year, and I didn't see her stand. Is Jeanette here? Okay. I'm really happy to offer my congratulations to all of the faculty earning tenure and promotion this year. It was such an honor to celebrate your hard work with you yesterday. For those who earned tenure and promotion this year, please stand to be acknowledged. I also really enjoyed honoring our faculty and staff who will be retiring. So if you are retiring, will you please stand? Our group represented over 500 years of service to this institution. And I want to thank you again for your service and wish you much joy in the days and the years ahead. So much has been accomplished, and I want to take a moment to celebrate some of those accomplishments. But I have a problem. There is so much to celebrate, it's impossible to be comprehensive. It could at least be a two-hour movie, if not a miniseries. So we just used some press releases to create a sample of our success, and I hope you enjoy this quick reflection. And first, I do want to stop and thank our graphic design student, Molly Barnett, for creating the video and the PowerPoint design.
That's what you did. That's what we do. And now it's my privilege, so listen carefully. I want to honor our spring 2018 faculty award recipients. So Angela, Dr. Riazzi, and Ken, will you please remain seated as I respectfully request all of your colleagues to stand and join me in an outstanding round of applause to congratulate you. In closing, I want to thank you again for accomplishing the extraordinary. Nowhere else will you find a staff and faculty as dedicated and willing to give 150% effort toward the accomplishment of our mission and reinvest assets in what matters most, our students. Inevitably, there are going to be challenges but we will continue to press and grow in spite of them. I look forward to us continuing to build our strength as we enhance communication, embrace data-informed governance, and bring a renewed focus to our strategic planning process. I am so incredibly proud of the work that you are doing and the impact you are having on our students. Thank you for allowing me to be part of this team and it's extreme privilege, and again, thanks for a great semester. <laughs>